I'm delighted to have a chance at the end of this conference, uh, or close to the end of it actually, um, to really take a wide view, a wide view and explore engaged compassion at the largest imaginable, the largest, or at least I can imagine it, the largest possible scale, at the scale of the whole human tribe, and to explore how we can bring um, engaged compassion to the crises and the needs of our days today. In effect, we have a time of both sorrow and hope. It's the entry lines to A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, the best of times, the worst of times. We have on the one hand, unprecedented peril, climate catastrophes, three billion of us are hungry, cannot afford, or food insecure, cannot afford a healthy diet. Eight men, eight men, and they're men, eight men own as much as half of humanity. Looming over our head, including currently, is the threat of nuclear war. Profit economies, grinding profit economies, crushing well-being, and growing tools of social control, genetic engineering, and who knows what is coming around the bend, growing tools of totalitarian control. On the other hand, the good news, the basis for hope, is unparalleled promise. We have a growing middle class worldwide. We have a long way to go, of course, in all these areas, but still positive developments we can um, take refuge in and find hope for. Uh, we have the growing greater power of women, so long overdue and still a long way to go. We have science, education, the internet, increasing civil society, particularly when you step back and compare um, to today's times, even with their perils, to what life was like, let's say, in Dickens, England, 150 or so years ago, or 1,500 years ago, or 15,000 years ago. And we have widening access to psychological tools, including the ones that are being presented and explored here at this wonderful conference. And worldwide, I don't have a scientific instrument for this one, but I think you probably sense it in yourself. Worldwide, in so many quarters, there's an underlying sense of enough. There's something fundamentally wrong with the system, with the structures of the world in which we live in terms of how they affect humanity and how humanity is affecting our one single precious vulnerable planet. Enough, something has got to change. So I have a question for you. When did you start to feel that there had to be a better way? And if I could, I'd like to share there are three personal experiences that relate to this. And you might reflect on this question yourself. Uh, one is that I think like many little kids, I had this sense that there was just a lot of unnecessary unhappiness. I, I grew up, so I'm a white American male. Uh, I grew up in a middle class, middle middle class suburban environment outside of Los Angeles in an intact family, loving and decent parents. I'm the oldest of three kids. Uh, and for all kinds of reasons, I just saw around me the normal bickering, hassling, fussing, anxiety, stressing, you know, divisions and rancor among the adults. I saw it among the kids. I saw the you know, adults to kids, kids to adults. I saw me to other kids, kids to me. And back in the background of just about all my memories as a little kid is this wistful, poignant longing. Wow, why is it like this? Why is there so much unnecessary unhappiness? I didn't know the answer to that question or what to do about that answer, but I knew there had to be a better way somehow in my bones. And that kind of set me on my course that eventually landed me uh, in the world of psychology and psychotherapy and positive neuroplasticity and spiritual practice. Second, as a young guy, I was 10 years old at the time, uh, and we moved to a southern state for the summer uh, just so my dad could do a program that he was in. Uh, he was a zoologist, uh, and I was uh, needing to use the bathroom, so I was walking toward a gas station, <clears throat> and I saw three doors. I'd never seen anything like it before. Men, women, colored. 1963. Men, women, colored. And I was shocked. I was stunned. I had never seen that sort of thing. And I, I could really feel pierced by the unfairness of it and the weirdness of it. Like, what? And a sense that there were large forces in play in the world I was in that were wounding, hurting, 
limiting and harming many, many, many perfectly ordinary people just like me, but for the colored skin, as it were, um, that they had. Wow. And then a third memory, a third experience. So I went to college in 1969. I was 16 when I started there. I was kind of young. And I kind of came of age in the mid-1960s, became politically aware uh, of the great time of change, powerful movements, wonderful, hopeful movements through the 70s, civil rights, women's movement, environmental movement, gay rights, and other movements as well. And I saw real changes produced when people could come together with a sense of common cause. I was in it. I felt it. I was part of the common cause. I was one tiny little drop, I think, in a mighty stream that left behind significant major lasting changes, improvements, while still, of course, we have a long way to go. And then in the mid-70s, in my own country, America, uh, moving into the 1980s and then afterward, I just saw that stream seemingly pretty much peter out. I'm sure there, there were people and still are people chipping away at various things, but it seemed as if that sense of common cause and the courage and compassion in common cause just somehow faded and was gradually pushed to the side by increasingly powerful structural forces, social, political, economic forces that at their base had tremendous injustice in them as uh, essentially a minority of people in America were seeking complete control. And I went myself at that time into the world of individual practice, personal practice, psychology, therapy, intense, wild and crazy human potential, personal growth workshops, contemplative practice, deep dive into that area as well. And there was kind of a hopefulness in myself, and I could see it in some other people, that these developments of, of qualities within the person that personal growth and a culture in America that actually became more receptive to things like psychotherapy, more open about alcoholism and drug addiction, uh, more concerned about things like bullying and child abuse, that these, that these individual scale positive developments would somehow translate into social change. But instead, it almost looks like we've gone backwards certainly over the last 10, 15 years or so. And we've seen a kind of regression as well in other places in the world in this kind of uh, movement out of civil society and democracy back into authoritarian control. And so it became increasingly clear to me that while the personal is really important, the personal level is really important, it's mainly what I do for a living, we need to pay attention to what could be called the political level as well, because personal development, healing, growing, and even awakening awakening does not inherently translate, does not inevitably necessarily translate into structural systemic change at the political level that is um, uh, in a, a source of great human suffering. So these are the kinds of concerns that I personally have lived through. And in the kind of late stage of my career, I'm very interested in exploring what we can actually do about engaged compassion at the systems level, the structural level, engaged compassion at scale. So compassion, as you well know, opens to suffering and brings caring to it and is moved to relieve suffering. It's not just emp empathy for suffering, not just a benevolence towards suffering, but a movement, as Paul Gilbert has really eloquently uh, pointed out, a movement to relieve suffering, certainly when we can, which involves changing its causes. And so certainly here, I'm drawing on the work of great scholars like Paul Gilbert and others, including um, their analysis of the deep causes of structural forces that generate vast amounts of suffering. And I'm drawing also on the great work of activists and teachers in the territory of engaged compassion. People like uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, bless his memory, the, the, the Dalai Lama, Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, in my country, people like Conda Mason, um, South Africa Tanisara, uh, Tara Brock, Jack Cornfield, in the United Kingdom, Great Britain, Jennifer Nadel, uh, Matt Hawkins, people that have worked with compassion in politics, and so many more. I don't presume to be any kind of an expert 
in either of these two streams. I'm a practical guy. I'm really interested in, hmm, what's the bottom line? What's the heart of the matter? What's the root of it all? And especially rolling up the sleeves, what can we do about it? So in that context of respect now, I'd like to explore my kind of take and offer it to you. And I really invite your take, your um, view and your wide view uh, about deep sources of suffering. So throughout history, it's a plain fact, there's just no denying it, is there, that much suffering has been caused by systemic political and economic forces that served some, some benefited from them, some maintained them at the cost of the many. And the same is certainly true for today. We, we can see this squarely. The, the foundation of all wisdom, certainly on um, the Buddhist tradition in which you know, I've been trained, uh, is clear seeing and uh, not having ignorance or delusion. We can see clearly without demonizing others, without hating them, without letting the poison of vengeance uh, penetrate our heart. And still, we can see clearly. If compassion is truly, truly to relieve suffering, it must think big enough wide enough and long enough to address these structural systemic forces, not just individual or interpersonal factors of suffering, as important as those are. The problem is that we live in this world and we take it for granted. It just seems so big, of course. Oh, well, it's, it's like this, so it must supposed to be like this, right? And we have the parable that's been expressed in different ways. You know, the first fish says to the second fish, good morning, how's the water? And the second fish pauses and goes, what's water? So I want to explore to some extent the strange waters we swim in today and uh, explore as well what makes them so strange, particularly when contrasted to the waters of social structure and culture and of daily life in which our species, our human species has swum for 97% of its 300,000 year more or less time on this planet until roughly the last 10,000 years. Here's the headline. The way we live today, the way we've lived, most of us, for the past 10,000 years is a vast and suffering saturated departure from the biological blueprint that we evolved for living together. Let's talk about hunter-gatherer politics. Humans, as you probably know, of, and I just said, have walked the earth for 300,000 years. Our immediate hominid tool manufacturing ancestors uh, lived and evolved for another two million or so years before that. And until farming and herding emerged uh, around 10,000 years ago, they lived in small, really small hunter-gatherer bands. Imagine, imagine being one of those human beings, just like you, just like me, maybe some minor genetic evolution along the way, this and that, but on the whole, anatomically modern, people like you and me walking the earth 20, 50, 100, 200,000 years ago. What would it have been like to, to have lived in that way? Dependent on each other, we'd be living uh, in a context with a foundation of social life that, that Paul has called caring and sharing, compassion and justice in a nutshell, rather than the holding and controlling strategy that every single other primate species used for it organizing its social life, which in my kind of quick summary phrase for it is grounded in alpha dominance, essentially. And I'm simplifying a lot of stuff, and I defer to the scholars who will definitely, you know, point out uh, the edge cases and the complications in what I'm saying here. But the essence of what I'm saying, I think, is quite clearly established and true. The callousness and cruelty, which also Paul has just been brilliant about shining a light on, the callous and cruelty in holding and controlling, which is still within our capacity, right, still found expression in frequently violent competition for scarce resources and tough conditions uh, between bands, certainly. But within the band, the key point, holding and controlling was constrained by three conditions that are present when you live together with 40 or 50 people most of your whole life. Imagine spending your days walking the Serengeti Plains, 
or the forests of the northern shores of the Mediterranean 40,000 years ago, or spreading throughout the world into Siberia and Asia. Imagine what life would be like living with the same people, struggling together with very few possessions, and your fates bound together. You'd be living with common truth, common welfare, and common justice. Let me tell you what I mean by that. So common truth, day after day, the facts are apparent. You know, who helps? Who's hurting? Who doesn't help? Who doesn't carry their weight? Um, did the hunt bring back food? Were we able to gather successfully? Where could we gather more successfully? Um, whose word can you trust? Who doesn't seem like someone who is safe to be around particularly or to do things with? The truth becomes really quite apparent. You can hide stuff for a little while, but when you live together, it becomes pretty apparent pretty soon. Also, common welfare. Fates bound together, also uh, kinship bonds. Um, what happened for some happened for all. If one person got into trouble, that affected everybody else. If the band prospered, that also affected everyone. And the self-interest of leaders was tied to the good of the group. Imagine that kind of world. And also common justice. Leaders <clears throat> had to face their people every day and see in the faces of the children, the old people, uh, their cousins, the consequences of the decisions they made as leaders. And leaders would have to face consequences very intimately uh, if they mistreated other people in significant and lasting ways. That's not idyllic. It's not utopian. I'm not claiming it is. On the other hand, if you think about it, it's a pretty fast departure from most of the ways that most of the people live uh, today. Politics, I'm going to use the P word here. Politics is about decision making, sharing resources, regulating power, protecting the vulnerable, and cooperative action. It's how we, it's our process. I'm a process guy. I think probably most of you as well uh, pay a lot of attention to process. Good process drives good outcomes, bad process drives bad outcomes. If outcomes are bad, look to bad process. And process is about governance at the group scale, the human tribe scale, is about governance and politics. Our process has gone very, very bad. With our big social brains, a politics for the common good emerged naturally from those three conditions, those three objective conditions that are inherent in hunter-gatherer life. We humans are best able to govern ourselves when the truth, obviously, is apparent to all, the welfare of the few is tied to the welfare of the many, and leaders face justice for their actions. Seems like obvious, right? Obvious. And yet, huh, <laughs> is that the way it is? This is how we evolve to govern ourselves. We are adapted biologically for optimal performance, optimal success, thriving. We are adapted for both surviving and thriving with this kind of group decision-making structure. But this is not how our world works today, is it? and vast suffering is the result. It can be almost exhausting to face this. And I encourage you maybe to take a breath or two and keep thinking with me as I am about what would make it better for real, which is where I'm going here. The bad news with concentrated wealth and power is that in hunter-gatherer bands, certainly, it was not, as I said, idyllic or utopian. There were leaders, there were inequities, there were you know, people who had higher status, for sure. And hunter-gatherer bands are still present in the world today. Um, still, that slope, the slope of the inequities, were constrained by common truth, welfare, and justice. But farming and herding enabled uh, surpluses and enabled larger and larger population groups. And those growing surpluses and, and growing size of groups enabled growing concentrations of wealth and power so that the inequities began to tilt further and further. And as those growing inequities and concentrations of wealth and power occurred, they fostered greater concentrations in a, in a kind of vicious cycle. And that ended common truth, common welfare, and common justice, or at least radically, dramatically eroded it. And as that occurred, and this is a crucial point that Paul has made eloquently and others as well, as um, the 
objective constraints of common, shared truth, welfare, and justice disappeared, that unleashed the atavistic primal strategy of controlling, pardon me, holding and controlling for the first time inside our societies. And kind of, sort of, more or less, it's been Game of Thrones for most people ever since. Just think about it. Uncommon truth, greed and corruption behind closed doors in the palace or the you know, the halls of power, truly fake news driven by uh, people with bad intentions. Truly fake news can spread virally today. And we've seen around the world, certainly in my own country, intense attacks on truth tellers, journalists, scientists, and just the very notion of factuality itself. What's actually the case? We have uncommon welfare today. The good fortune of some is usually distinct from, it's not affected by the struggles and often poverty of the many. And as the meteoric rise in the wealth over the last decade, for example, of the top 1% of 1% in the world has not generally lifted the middle class uh, around the world, including in my own country, the wealthiest country in the world. And we have uncommon justice. You know, the classic phrase, rich man's law, rich person's law, you know, poor person's law. Uh, governing elites are routinely not held to account. They can hire lawyers. We're observing that in my country as well right now. That can just postpone, 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 you know, a reckoning. And um, as the saying has it, um, and I'm, forgive me for not being able to recall the, the source of it, you know, justice deferred is justice denied. And governing elites not held to account, and they're insulated in their country clubs, their air conditioning, their their you know shining house on the hill. They're insulated from the people they harm. Consider this slide. Just take a moment to kind of register it. Half of us, people like you and me, live under a, a dictator's thumb right now, today in the world. Basically, just six percent of us live in a full democracy, and that um, by the the account of the people who do this is not America or Great Britain. Um, many equalities persist for children, for women, and for other groups. Each day, it's so heavy to just let it land in your heart. Each day, 10,000 children die of hunger related causes. Right now, today, 10,000 kids. I have two precious kids with my wife. They're adults now. I love children. Um, over 3 million a year dying of because they don't have enough food. Can you believe it? That's the state of the world today. It's the water we swim in. We hardly notice it. It's not headline news. It's true, though. Stolen wealth, the legacy of slavery and colonialism for centuries, reaching back even farther than centuries, you know, extracting trillions of dollars. It's, it's so much, it's hard, you know, there's like no, there's almost no upper bound on how much theft has occurred, stolen, extracted, to line the pockets and line the economies and drive the economies of the wealthier nations and people of the world. 8% uh, of the people in the world hold 85% of its riches right now today. And this wealth creates concentrations of power and corrupts and influence of our politics. For example, in America, in 16 years from 2000 to 2016, for which there's good data, the fossil fuel industry spent $2 billion to halt climate action, and they were very successful. $2 billion to influence you know, laws in, in Amer and policies in America. Worldwide, there's a trillion dollars in bribes offered every year. Definitely the uncommon good. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that all those with wealth and power have gained it unfairly or ignored the common good. Wealthy benefactors have supported many wonderful things, certainly. Uh, wise, large-hearted leaders have made great contributions. Absolutely true, absolutely true. Um, I'm just inviting us to step back though and see the big picture uh, of the world we live in today and the world um, people just like you and me have lived in for the last 10,000 years. In that big picture, we see clearly that wealth and power have been used routinely throughout history to hide the facts, decouple private gains from public welfare, and shield leaders from justice, all to gain even more wealth and power. That's a fact. Wow.
Sorry to depress you. <laughs> there is good news coming. <laughs> There's so much suffering now, isn't there? Due to these structural forces, I'm profoundly privileged. I'm uh, privileged and advantaged. I, I caught the genetic lottery um, and I've been advantaged in many ways um, as a white man in America through the disadvantages structurally that have been pushed onto others. A fair amount of my own good fortune is ill-gotten gains, uh, including in the ways that, that reaches back through history as a white man in America. And you gotta face it, gotta face it, feel it, recognize it, open one's heart, have compassion for ourselves uh, to be able to open the heart enough to really, really face it. Okay, what can we do? What can we do? We can go big, we can go wide, and we can go long. So our problems are big. We can chip away at them bit by bit, and that's certainly helpful. Think what the world would be like if there weren't so many people in so many organizations worldwide, including sitting next to you in the room that you're in right here or with you online as you watch this. So many people and organizations are, are helping. It's really, really important. They're chipping away at things. We'd have a really tough world without that. And structurally, systemically, while there have been some improvements, as you saw in some of my slides and you know well yourself, there, is, there are still enormously powerful forces that produce vast amounts of suffering. The way to deal with them, I think, and the only thing we can do, building on individual and organizational efforts, in a sense locally or in a particular domain, is to come together at scale, as our hunter-gatherer ancestors did, in which the many in the band, grounded in common truth, welfare, and justice, would come together to regulate the few and to create a life that worked for everyone, not just for some. We must come together in ways that are big enough to solve these big problems and create a framework in which we can actually do that. And so I've been deeply engaged with some other key people, including Paul Gilbert and others involved with your conference, to be able to do this. Entrenched interests, interestingly, compete at the marketplace level. I've just been so struck by this observation. They compete at the marketplace level, but they cooperate at the political level, pooling their money at enormous scale, hundreds and hundreds, billions probably worldwide, of dollars every year to influence policy in both legal and predominantly corrupt ways around the world. But on the other hand, isn't it interesting that pro-social groups usually do the opposite. They're friendly with each other. I've seen it directly many, many times. They're friendly and cooperative with each other at the local level, but they rarely put their money in the same bucket. They rarely combine their resources at the political level at a scale that can compete with entrenched interests. That's a deep lesson, isn't it? And it's also a great opportunity for us to think about a framework or a way for pro-social groups and individuals worldwide to cooperate and coalesce and collaborate with each other at a scale that can finally make a big difference in these systemic structural sources of so much suffering. Compassion has been growing wonderfully, and it's typically practiced one-to-one, -one or one to many, in which someone teaches compassion to a group or draws people into compassion as a group. That's fantastic. And to be big enough to really change our big problems, we need to unleash the power of many to many, groups of groups, and form a truly global coalition at the scale of the whole human tribe. It's very exciting that we're actually doing this. So. With others, uh, we've established the Global Compassion Coalition, and I'm inviting you to join us, absolutely. The Global Compassion Coalition for the Science, Education, Application, and Advocacy of Compassion, with a board of directors, of legal status, tax-deductible applications filed, we're in process there. We have an advisory council that's growing. Uh, we're inviting, uh, you know, supporting, you know, 
distinguished supporters and everyone else, individuals and organizations uh, with our key staff. Uh, our mission is restoring compassion and justice in the foundation of all societies. That's an ambitious mission, but we're really serious about it. And we intend to accomplish this mission and we're gonna learn more along the way for sure. This will be revised along the way, including maybe some of the terms that are being used here. But what we're thinking to do initially is to help our members first do what they do even better in terms of the science, education, application, and advocacy, as well as developing many uh, sections uh, in which it's compassion and, compassion and the climate crisis, compassion and children, compassion and politics, and many other compassion and sections. So help the people who are doing what they're doing do it better through opportunities for collaboration, shared information, showcasing best practices, uh, being a vehicle for funding money to things that are really working, and so on. That's a good foundation. But if that's all we do, that would be disappointing. We also intend to drive influence campaigns for years, even decades, with a serious budget, because that's what it will take, an influence campaign through media and other sources, other means in our culture and our politics to really foreground compassion and justice as fundamental values in our policies and our politics and more broadly even in our culture to actually change over time the water we swim in. There's a proverb, you may have heard it, I think about it a lot, bad farmers grow weeds, good farmers grow crops, Great farmers grow soil. This influence campaign is intended to gradually fertilize the soil and change the soil uh, uh, in which humanity rests uh, for the greater good of all of us. And then on the basis of all that, we intend to pursue with other allies um, a flagship project that's worth doing in its own right, such as ending child hunger or capping a global warming at just three degrees Fahrenheit, which is about as good as we're gonna be able to do by the end of the century, which is bad enough, but not extraordinarily catastrophic, which is what we're racing toward, unfortunately. So take on a flagship project that's worth doing in its own right, but to accomplish it necessarily, it leaves civil society in its wake, changing the governance and the politics uh, that is the root source in our processes of whether hum humanity as a whole thrives or only some thrive. We're launching in 2023 and we're already going. So these are some of the specific concrete things that you'll be seeing. A major website, uh, Compassion Plus information, symposia and projects in particular areas, a regular newsletter and magazine, maybe leading toward a scientific journal. Uh, Paul has flagged some of the costs of that and we'll keep thinking about it. Developing a compassion index. One of our board members, Jim Doty from CCARE at Stanford uh, has really pushed forward this notion and developed some foundational work and, and others have as well. What's well, a suffering index and a compassion index? That's a metric, a good enough metric that we can improve over time then can tell us what we're doing. Compassion-related uh, microgrants for a whole generation, a whole new generation of researchers and activists. Uh, we'll be developing the first annual Compassion Prizes to showcase people and organizations around the world who are doing wonderful things and, of course, garnering more attention in the broader culture. Uh, we hope to and we intend to launch in 2023 our first annual Festival of Compassion and I want to tip my hat here as well to Dr. Jim Doty for developing these ideas tremendously. And we're going to be building over time to some really spectacular annual uh, festivals of compassion supported by other kinds of regional activities. We can begin even in next year. I'm a practical person, you build over time, but still we can start moving to work next year. The beginnings of that influence campaign and flagship project and much much more. To me, there have been a lot of gestures in the direction of a better world, a lot of kind of hopeful hand-wringing thoughts and prayers. I'm, I'm fine with the talk. You got to talk to walk, right? But there's been a lot of talk without walk 
And we're really focused on the walk that is the application at scale of Compassion Talk. So in 2023, we'll have our formal launch, as I said. You can join the coalition now. We hope you will. Um, and we'd love to have you, uh, yourself as individually and organizations too, and to learn more. Please go to our kind of initial, <laughs> just beginning website, the Global Compassion Coalition org. That's thinking big. And I think we need to think big, go big to help big. We also need to go wide. And here I'd like to introduce a little very practical neuroscience. In a nutshell, um, when you have a wider view, you quiet activity in midline cortical networks, task oriented in the front, default mode so-called in the back, uh, and uh, both those networks get quieter and lateral networks get more active, it's typically in the right hemisphere of right-handed people because that hemisphere is involved with holistic processing in a wider view. And when you take a wider view, which we're exploring right now, it draws us into the present because these midline, net, midline networks are very into the future and the past with mental time travel. So boom, what's the present right now with a wider view? A wider view relaxes the contracted sense of me, myself, and I and opens us up into relatedness with others. And you could try it right now as I talk. Can you be aware of your chest as a whole as you breathe? Can you be aware of your body as a whole? Can you be aware of the volume of the room you're in, the space that you're in? And notice what happens within seconds, within breaths, certainly, in your body and your mind as you get more of a sense of things as a whole. Notice your sense of greater openness to others and greater readiness for compassion and greater uh, interest in uh, connecting with others as you widen your view, including taking a kind of panoramic perspective, a bird's eye view on the state of the world today. Notice what happens inside you as you do that based on actual changes grounded in research, um, indicated by research inside your own brain. Also, as you widen your view, you start disengaging from stressful doingness driven by midline cortical activation and rest increasingly in a sense of being, which can also be the uh, basis for effective doing. Further, widening the view brings in more information. As Barbara Fredrickson, great researcher in positive emotions, has shown that as we, uh, through positive emotion, become more comfortable with a wider view rather than a narrow one on the one tile in the mosaic of the mind that is flashing red, as we form that wider view, we become more creative. We become more able to see the bigger picture to help us manage stresses and recover even from trauma. More information, including about other people. And fundamentally, in terms of the greater good, this wider view fosters a sense of connectedness with all things, including all beings, a wider sense of interdependence and connection, feeling increasingly not beleaguered and isolated, but instead buoyed, supported by so many things that can be forces for a lived courage forces for a lived connection and a lived confidence and compassion with other people, including with them in common cause. The points I've made here are supported by good research initially developed by Norm Farb and colleagues. Simply put, the blue squiggles there have to do with midline activation when we're caught up in me, myself, and I and engaging a lot of mental time travel. Not so good, a narrow view, a contracted view. But when we open into that wider view, lateral networks in the right hemisphere of the brain uh, become much more active. This is switched probably for many, many left-handed people. The point is widening your view really helps. And in the context of what we're talking about here, I find it so important, especially to defeat the sense of being disheartened 
You know, there's a kind of combination these days of outrage and despair. Well, despairing, hopeless, helpless outrage is toxic for the brain and frankly kind of toxic in our relationships. Yes to outrage, but no to despair. And it's together that we will find the hope that is real, realistic hope to make a better world. It's really helpful to remember that our biological nature, our blueprint, the normal water for our species is caring and sharing, grounded in the truth of living together, creating societies that work for all of us. Not utopian, people still compete, people still struggle, people get cranky with each other, no doubt, in hunter-gatherer bands. And still, the foundation is caring and sharing, creating societies that work for all of us. And then the classic three poisons, or in an earlier translation of the Buddhist teachings, the fuels of suffering. The classic fuels of suffering, hatred, greed, and delusion, are reduced. They're still individual scale fuels for, for those sorts of things, but social forces that drive hatred, greed, and delusion are diminished in a foundation of caring and sharing. That's the normal human condition. Mother nature is on our side. Good news. <laughs> We don't have to scratch and claw our way against the stream. We need to roll with the stream of our biological blueprint. It is the abnormal pathological systemic structures of holding and controlling that have dramatically fueled those fires of hatred, greed, and delusion for the past 10,000 years. It's good news that we just have to get normal again. Most of the people today, there's a very important point, who maintain these abnormal structures, they're unaware of the full consequences of their roles and decisions. They're not evil. I have cousins who are in the oil industry, wonderful people who absolutely oppose any kind of me significant measure to halt the climate catastrophe. Um, I have friends and family who are deeply religious uh, in a Christian framework who still entirely support uh, policies and politics that would appall, I think, appall Jesus were he to walk the earth today, the streets of America. Um, it's their incentives that maintain the status quo. And to change those incentives, we can draw a great lesson from the evolution of altruism that's unique, essentially, in our own species. For altruism to evolve, in hunter-gatherers and, and the hominids, the later hominids especially that preceded them, um, you know, certain conditions had to be present. Otherwise, it would be a cost for individual survival to share food or to, to risk attack on yourself to protect others. But as, as, but as caring and sharing, uh, as our social brain began to develop in this context of uh, living together, the truth was common. And today, we have opportunities to create incentives by driving truth-telling and being brave enough to stick our head up and to stand up and stand for other people and speak truth to power and tell the truth about what's happening today. We can also value common welfare and common justice. So right here, we are starting to restore these three fundamental conditions for a healthy human politics, healthy human process and self-governance. We can also create benefits for caring and sharing. We can look for ways to encourage it, to praise it, to create financial incentives uh, of different kinds. And we can aim for this in a very deliberate and far-reaching kind of way that doesn't fool around. And speaking of not fooling around, we can create costs of various kinds for holding and controlling without the cost for freeloaders, ripoff artists, con artists, charlatans, and bullies and within hunter-gatherer bands, they, uh, without those costs, they would not be regulated. They would not have stopped what they're doing. We have to think about costs, but we can do all this. By, we can see what we see, value what we value, and plan what we plan without being invaded by righteousness and hostility. Very important point. Just because we can see clearly and create both benefits and costs related to holding to caring and sharing and holding and controlling doesn't mean that we're othering others or turning them into an enemy. We can do both. And at the political level, at the systemic level, 
we can recognize structural sources of suffering and the incentives that perpetuate it while valuing a world that, for example, halts global warming at just three degrees Fahrenheit, let's say, or worst case, two degrees Celsius. And we can act effectively to change those systemic sources of suffering while not making others into enemies. And I think clearly here we have two great historic examples of that. Uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, bless his memory, and His Holiness the Dalai Lama, people who have dealt with tremendous injustice, tremendous suffering, uh, with tremendous compassion, uh, while holding their enemies with compassion in their own hearts. That's going wide. We also need to go long and to think long and to think about the world that we can make together. It took 10,000 years to get us here. It's gonna take us a while, definitely a while, to get to a better place, decades, centuries. All right, but with that long view, we can be realistically hopeful because it's gonna take a while to change things. And we need to sustain steady effort over time that will, in fact, establish compassion, actually, and justice at the heart of global society. I invite you to think about what you'd like to see in the world that we share with each other. I think of this as big change by 2100. I think my kids might see the end of this century. I don't think I will, unless there's some kind of extraordinary medical breakthrough in the next 10 years or so. Uh, and I certainly, if my kids ever have kids, uh, their, their children, my grandchildren, will certainly see the end of the century. What would you like to see by the end of the century, realistically? No child? going hungry or being neglected or abused. That would be a huge change. How about global warming capped at three degrees Fahrenheit? Anything less than that is going to be catastrophic. How about everyone, not just maybe half of us, really 6% of us living in truly civil society with the rule of law, uh, pluralism, respect for human rights, leaders held to account politically. Wouldn't that be great? How about all children educated worldwide through high school, not just some boys? And humanity all together living in harmony in the, with, our, with nature, with our one precious home planet. You just sit for a moment and go, yeah. On the one hand, for sure we should have those changes by then. Of course. Why don't we live like this already? And then you realize, wow, we, <laughs> we have a lot of work to do. Compassion calls us to do nothing less than to aim for those systemic structural improvements in the human condition, which will benefit other species as well by the end of the century. Compassion calls us to nothing less. And <laughs> compassion tells us, wow, we have a big job ahead. To do that job, to stay the course, we need to grow and tap into courage and hope, love and clear seeing, and common cause for the common good. So I'd like to take a few moments here, with your permission, at the end of my presentation, to just rest together in a sense of these, which will involve changing our brains gradually, slowly, but surely for the better. So I invite you with me to take a few moments as we finish here to rest in the sense of courage, a quiet courage in your own heart. A stubborn, steady persistence, even when it's scary or hard. Can you gently open to a sense rested in the heart? That's the root of the word courage. Of a certain determination on behalf of all beings. Can you find hope? A realistic hope for a, a better future than the one, than the present 
we're living in. A long view. As the saying puts it, the arc of history is long, but it curves toward justice. Paraphrasing, I believe, Dr. Martin Luther King. Can we do this? Can we take the long view? Can we keep stepping with love in our heart? Not hate, love in our heart, along with clear seeing. Forming common cause for the common good with the people around you as you sit together, the people watching online, the people in the world today, right now, who are making efforts for the sake of the greater good. Common cause, community. In a traditional term, a sangha for the common good. What's it feel like to be connected with others in this way? And you might notice a sense of being heartened and supported in your own efforts toward the common good through the sense of community and connection with others who are doing much the same. And Whatever has been wholesome and beneficial in your practice right now as you, you've opened to and invited gently these qualities to fill you increasingly, you can take in the good and let these sink in, spreading throughout your body, establishing themselves in you so that you, including through neuroplastic changes, become more established in courage, hope, love, clear seeing and a sense of common cause for the common good. To close, each one of us has been loved into being by one or more people. And I'm drawing here on a beautiful comment from Frank Rogers, Mr. Rogers, uh, an American um, advocate for children and teacher of children and many adults, including me. Each of us has been loved into being by one or more people. Similarly, in the same way, we can love others into being. That's our opportunity and even responsibility. And by joining together at the global scale, we can love into being the world that we long for with compassion at its heart. That's the deep wish I have as I look at the remainder of my own life, however long that might be, and it's my deepest wish for all beings, certainly including all human beings, um, and for the world that our children and their children and their children will inherit with compassion at its heart. Thank you. <laughs>